Are you confused by the parables of Matthew 13? Well, I have a series on each parable. However, there is a mystery in the entire chapter. There is a reason that Matthew put the parables together in a particular order. So it's going to be like putting together a puzzle. We're going to take fragments and pieces and we're going to build it to take a look at the entire structure so you can have a complete idea of what Matthew was trying to say and really the mystery behind it. My name is Vince. I want to thank you for joining me today. If you can hang in there to the end of the video, I think you will be very surprised. Matthew's Gospel is written topically. And what he's doing here, especially in Matthew 13, is he's using these parables to set something up. He's setting boundaries. They're set to contain our context. There's keywords deliberately placed in certain places so they hold the structure or framework together. The first key word is parables. We find it in 1 and 53. And then the C in verses 1 and 47, the beach verses 2 and 48, the kingdom of heaven verses 10 and 47. So obviously, even before we get the mention of the kingdom of heaven, he has set up a containment or structure by putting the word parables in verse 1 and 53. Now, Matthew sets our context with these boundaries, so that means everything between 1 and 53 is interrelated. They're all connected. Matthew intentionally formatted the sequence of the parable via these keywords because we will see is he's trying to set up these parables in a certain sequential order. To fully comprehend the parables of Matthew 13, what we need to do is we need to build it like a puzzle. First of all, a fragment or a word or two within each parable helps us put together pieces of the puzzle. So we connect one fragment to another and we get a section of the puzzle bill. We might complete several sections by looking at different parables and before long we could put the entire pieces of the puzzle together into one perspective and that's what we're doing here we start with the parable of the sower it is about the wheat of the church age see the wheat is the believer and everything else the thorns they're not believers tares they're not believers this parable specifically is about who gets in. Now, Matthew 13, 23 says, And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit, bring forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. So the key is to bearing fruit. In other words, if there is no fruit, the stock of wheat is useless. So what ha do we need to be able to have fruit? First of all, we needed to have good soil. Good soil causes maturity. It results in a right heart. Now, the condition of the heart is what determined what happened to each person in the parable. But it was only the wheat that matured. And because that person had the right heart, the kingdom person both heard and understood what the word of God was saying, literally what Jesus and his deity conveyed to us. They did something with it, too. If they brought forth fruit, in other words, faith without works is dead, and with no works and without faith, there is no fruit. So we respond to God so that God can use our fruit or our seed elsewhere. Let's talk about the wheat and tares. A lot of fragments of the puzzle here need to be put together because this one is a little bit more confusing 
the most, but it's really not if you look at all the details that are put together here. Now, first of all, wheat always represents a believer. In this case, just as it did in the parable of the sower. But when I say it's a wheat of a different kind, it has to grow a little bit different because both are planted in good soil. Both are of the same good seed. But the problem is in this parable, somebody nasty is going to come in there and plant tares or plant weeds within the field. So here's what the parable says. Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, obviously the man who sowed is Je the son of man, Jesus. The good seed is the message that was given them through the word and it was planted in his field. Now he does say the field later represents uh, the world. But in this case, he's saying his field. So he is implying something in this parable, and that is that he is the owner. And that'll come up in a little bit as we look at this passage. Verse 25, but while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went away. Okay, enemy, who's that? Well, we all know who God's enemy is, right? Satan. So he's coming in there and he's planting people to try and take away from the men or the people that God has planted seeds in their heart. Now, it does mention while men were sleeping. That is not there by accident or by coincidence. Every jot and tittle is there for a reason. The implication is the resurrection has not happened yet. Believers sleep. Believers don't die. So the implication is while this is going on, it's going at it on at a time where the resurrection and rapture have not yet occurred. Verse 26. But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, And enemy has done this and then his slaves answered and said to him do you want us then to go and gather them up he said no lest while you are gathering up the tares you may root up the wheat with them now let's take this in perspective we know the landowner is god but who are these slaves okay we don't exactly know 100 percent but there is an implication because this is an end time event once we get further down in the passage or we will recognize surely it is an end time event so the slaves here would be anybody anointed from god or if night is coming when no man can work this would more than likely be prophets of god who are constantly called the prophets, his servants, or his servants, the prophet. Besides, who else would have the power to tear up the weeds? Let's think about Elijah for a second, because he's probably going to be one of these slaves. He is probably the prophet that is going to come back and maybe Elijah with it, I'm sorry, maybe Enoch along with them, some say Moses. But the idea here they had the power to do things that no other people have done since the time of Jesus or the time of Moses. So this becomes very, very instrumental of driving the agenda also, because we would see that it's probably the same time that the two prophets are on earth. And that's what the word servants is talking about. And that's what the word saying, hey, you want us to gather them up? Well, let's look at verse 30 now. The landowner says, allow both to grow together until the harvest. When's the harvest? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. They're, the harvest is the end of the age. It says so right here. In the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, I will say to the angels, first gather up the tares, bind them in bundles to be burned but gather up the wheat into my barn. Now, let's put this again in perspective. The angels are going out at the end of the age, so therefore these people will be living at that time. They will gather up 
tares, the tares are going to be cast into hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the other gathering is of the wheat. It goes into his barn for future use. Now, I said there was no reference to barn that I could find. I did find one. I, mean, I said this in the Wheat and Tares parable that I put together uh, several weeks ago. This particular thing is talking about something that happens in Haggai 2, 18 and 19. And it tells us that the wheat in the barn or the seed in the barn listen to these words 19 is the seed still in the barn including the vine the fig tree the pomegranate the olive tree it does not bore fruit yet from this day on i will bless you it's an end time age event the story of the wheat in the barn is exclusively for the purpose to be used by god for his glory Yeah, but you say, Vince, wheat, that's the church. It's not Israel, it's the church. Okay, you want more proofs that the wheat in this particular case is Israel or specifically the remnant of Israel? You need to see a few more fragments? Well, let's go over here with Matthew 13, 38 to start. The good seed, the good seed. He's talking about the parable here. These are the sons of the kingdom. But within the context of Matthew 8, 11 through 13, we are going to define who the sons of the kingdom are. So the sons of the kingdom, listen to this. I say to you, Jesus is the speaker here, that many shall come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But but the sons of this kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. In the place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So they're going where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who's he talking about? The sons of the kingdom here. The other tares that were with the wheat. So the sons of the kingdom, specifically, whether they get in or get cast out, is talking about the people of Israel. The ones that go into the kingdom that aren't tossed out are the remnant. The sons of the kingdom, just like the church, are present in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, let's talk about wheat differences. The church believer and the remnant of Israel, that believer, are going to be different in a lot of ways. First of all, the church must exist until the resurrection and the rapture happens. Therefore, once that happens, the age of grace has come to a closure and the world goes into a new dispensation. The church returns after the remnant of Israel repents. Very important. Why? We cannot get the blessing of the new covenant, which we are partakers of, but that covenant has to be made with the nation of Israel, according to Jeremiah 31. So we have to wait for them to accept it. Then what happens? We will arrive in our glorified bodies. That means no more death. That means we'll always exist. We'll be like the angels that are in heaven. Now, regarding the wheat of Israel, the remnant of Israel repents after the resurrection. And this will explain why they do not get glorified body, because the resurrection has happened. That has to happen at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, what's going to happen? As people of Israel start repenting, the tares of Israel are going to be removed by the angels as other Israelites are turning toward God. So one goes into the fire, one goes into the barn. At that given point, the sons enter the kingdom. Once they're all in the barn, the son enter the kingdom, the sons enter the kingdom with their human bodies. And these bodies will live over a thousand years. Remember, the longest a person lived on earth 
was a guy named Methuselah, and he missed it by that much, but he was here almost for a thousand years. Every one of the sons of the kingdom will live more than a thousand years. Please consider giving us some thumbs up here so we could get this video out to more people. Consider subscribing. We're going to be coming up with a teaching on the fig tree, and I think that's going to be a doozy. Now, regarding Matthew 13 and the parable puzzle so far, what we learned, it's about who is part of the kingdom, who the kingdom specifically is for when Christ comes to reign. Now, the first thing we noticed in the parable of the sower was about church age believers. That's Jews and Gentiles that follow Jesus Christ. However, I would not necessarily exclude that it could not include the people that existed before the church age as well. Secondly, as unbelieving Israel is removed, believing Israel remains and enters that kingdom. And according to the prophet Joel, all Israel will be saved at that time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the mustard seed. Now, what I did is I paraphrased it, replacing metaphors with something that's a little bit more literal, sounds a little bit different, but I think it gets the point across on this particular parable. And it reads, the seed of least faith Jesus took and established by his word in his world. And though of the least faith that all the others he planted in the garden, when fully developed, it is bigger than those garden plants of greater faith, becoming huge. And the evil spirits in the atmosphere come and live within its offshoot. So what we're seeing here is that something started out good. There were other plants in his garden. The one that was the smallest seed grew into the biggest plant, and the other seeds that were bigger stayed small, yet they had greater faith. Now, what's being described here is what will happen to the church majority over time. It's something that we see happening today, and it's getting a lot worse. What happens is as the church has grown, Satan, who operates in our atmosphere, sees that he needs to become an influence within the larger churches. So therefore, he makes his home there, influencing the church. The holiness of the large church denomination ultimately then become compromise because it's under the influence of Satan, whose birds have made it their home. So this parable shows the majority of the church will become rebellious and unholy. Go turn on your TV today. Watch some of the stuff on YouTube. Go vig visit some of these bigger churches and see what's going on, and I think you'll get the point. Church, the last generation. Well, it's probably not really a church at all, but it is about what becomes of the church. Listen to my paraphrase of Matthew 13 33. The kingdom of heaven is like sin, which an evil one took and hid in sufficient measures in a new lump until it was filled with sin. So the implication of the Bible, throughout the Bible, the word leaven always represents sin. No, it, you have to maintain expositional constancy. You can't talk. It's about the gospel message spreading. You can't say that. It always represents sin. Take a look at this verse. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. It's basically what was in the parable. But what he's saying is a little sin spread through the entire body. So what is this meaning? Well, it means it's contaminated. It goes from one person to the next. It ferments. The implication is the sin spreads so much that this entire new lump became contaminated by it. So in essence, it became useless for God to do anything with because they're no longer 
holy. They're no longer set apart. And Paul warned us that this would happen in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 3. But I want to emphasize, I've taken some of the words out so I can speed up the process here. Now, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, and he's talking about the return of Christ, the kingdom, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So in essence, before the man of lawlessness appears or about the same time that he has appeared, this new church generation will be in total rebellion toward God. Okay, so let's go back, putting more pieces of the puzzle in place. Let's look at our parable structure here. We learned that the first two parables covered those who are saved by faith. In essence, these two groups are a part of the kingdom of heaven. The sower parable told us the church believers would be inclusive. It's a unity of Israel and Gentile believers. The tares and the wheat was about the returning of the remnant of Israel at the end of the age in physical bodies. So you got people in glorified bodies and physical bodies, both in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the digression of the church is basically what you had in the last two parables, which in the case of the mustard seed showed a moral deterioration of the church. Of course, that is happening now. We see it all over the place. Also, the leaven represented a church generation that would go into complete apostasy. There would be few believers left around at that time. Okay, for the parable of the hidden treasure, my paraphrase, I'm going to start off with again, because it's very simple and easier to understand. Now, I want to reiterate, I do have a video that you can watch that explains how I came to my conclusions. Let me read it to you here. Matthew 13, 44, paraphrase. The kingdom of heaven is like the wisdom of fearing the Lord that is hidden in this world, which a person discerned and understood and hid in his heart. And from the joy over it, he goes and sells all he has and buys the truth of the world to come. Now, Isaiah 35 I'm sorry, Isaiah 33, 6b says, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. It's talking about a person here. It's not talking about the Lord. Therefore, what this is referring to is the tribulation believer. The tribulation believer is going to be the one that has to be able to get rid of everything he has in this world to be able to get the hidden treasure, which is God himself, or being within the kingdom with God in the world to come. The parable is basically talking about not taking the mark of the beast. In other words, it doesn't say that in there, but think of it. Somebody is going to have to give it all away, everything he has. But he will get the benefit of the next world. Regarding the pearl of great value or great price, I'm working from my paraphrase again. There's a video on it if you want to learn the details on how I came to this conclusion. But let me read it here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the ten tribes of Ephraim seeking spiritual wealth and upon doing so finds his God. By removing all he acquired, he obtains the one of greatest worth of courts, which is God himself. So what we have, they're back. This is the most important part of scripture because God must fulfill his promises to Israel. And it would make sense to have the majority of 
Israel present, you would need the 10 returning tribes that were sent into exile. They are back. They have returned to the God because they found that everything they were looking for that they thought had value was not worth it. So again, like the parable of the treasure, they must release all they have in order to acquire the greatest possession of all, and that would be a relationship with God himself. So the majority of Israel returned to God, which is Ephraim makes up its 10 tribes to implement the kingdom of God. As a result, God is their pearl of greatest value. Okay, let's put together the final pieces of the puzzle. The parable of the dragnet. Again, from my prior video where I did research and explained how I came to this conclusion, it is available. But I am going to use just my paraphrase because it really does the job explaining this parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the angelic host cast into Satan's dominion gathering people of every nation. And when completed, the angels hauled them up to the staging area, and they sat down preparing the righteous people, the good fish, for further existence. But the wicked, the angels threw away into the furnace of hell for eternal suffering. So it shall be at the end of Satan's age. Now, if we understand what's going on, there are people here that are going into the Messianic kingdom, going into the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. But the basis of getting into this kingdom is different. It's different because the age of grace, or rather the dispensation of grace, ended with the rapture. So how do these people get in? Well, let's talk about why they get in first. The dragnet's purpose, in other words, the angelic host that was cast into the sea, into Satan's realm, has a purpose. It is to provide the subjects of the kingdom. See, the saints, the nation of Israel, they are all a part of God's kingdom the kingdom of heaven. But what is a kingdom who doesn't have subjects? So how do these people get in? First of all, they do get in with physical bodies, just like the remnant got in. They had physical bodies. So will the good fish. But here's something really interesting. The entry is based on Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3. And the purpose of those verses is to explain the Abrahamic covenant. So anyone who blessed Abraham or his descendants would be blessed by God according to that covenant. Anybody who cursed Abraham or his descendants, for example, the bad fish, they would fall under God's judgment under a curse. So as a result of the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant, certain people who treated Israel or someone from Israel kindly during the tribulation period, they will get into God's millennial kingdom. Let's put the final pieces of the puzzle together. Why did Matthew structure chapter 13 the way he did? There was a reason. I mentioned this at the beginning of the study. It completes a mystery that most people overlook. They just look at things parable by parable, but don't put them all together. And once you do that, you get a complete understanding of what Matthew is trying to say. Now, he gave us the first two parables, and they are very important because they are talking about selection for the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody is going to get in. Of course not. But 
he tells us who gets in and who does not get in. Now, the first thing he does in the parable of the sower, he tells us that believers get in. Most people believe this is referring to the church age believer. I'm starting more to lean toward all believers because Christ planted the seed throughout the ages, whether it was the antediluvian period before the flood or after the flood or after the Tower of Babel, before the Abrahamic covenant or after the law was given. He planted seeds in all those people. The question is, which one provided more seeds? Which one matured unto completion because they had the right soil. So even though if you go with the church age believers, I'm fine with that, but I'm leaning that it's talking about every believer because we're all saved by faith. The next, the parable of the wheat, the ones with tares, is all about returning back. It's all about the coming back of the remnant of Israel at the close of the age. And this is very important because it is a distinction from the pre-existing believers because these people, these descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob enter the kingdom at the end of the age with physical bodies. These men and women will not die they will go on to live and make it over a thousand years of age, something that was never done before. Now, we have the selection of who got in, who becomes a kingdom member, and who does not by their removal. So, what we're going to start to see is why Matthew put the other parables in the order that he did. You're going to see that it is a chronological history or perhaps a prehistory of the kingdom as it was prophesied. So what happens in the next two parables? You have a digression and you have a rebellion within the church. The mustard seed showed us that the church would deteriorate. The mainstream church, the bigger churches, would become so influenced by Satan, even though they started out with faith, that ultimately they would become more subjugated to what Satan is saying rather than what God is saying. You see it today. It's happening now. All the changes within the churches, especially those big ones. Now, also, he told us about the parable of the leaven. Now, in this particular case, it exposes that we will get to a point where there will be a future generation that will go into total apostasy, something that Paul talked about, that the church would be in full rebellion, falling away. But the reality of it is there will always be some church believers left in the body of Christ until the resurrection and the rapture. Now, as things are getting worse, not just within the church, the world is getting worse. It is about to be progressively moving into the period of the Antichrist. So what you're going to have in the remaining three parables of what's going to be closing out the church age, Israel returning, and who the subjects are invited in the kingdom. So let's talk about the treasure, because the treasure is all about revealing the tribulation period. See, if you're living in this world at that time, and you recognize the treasure in God, and have a fear for him, those people will be willing to give up all that this world has to offer. They'll sell it off. They'll get rid of it. And they're getting rid of it because they're acquiring the treasure that is hidden in the field of the kingdom of God, the next world. So in other words, we may have martyrs here. We may have people suffering right up until the time that the resurrection and the rapture of the church occurs. Then we have the parable of the merchant. Notice, stop here, take a look. It's a progressive order that is occurring. 
Again, it's chronological. It's sequenced out for us to understand why Matthew put the parables together this way. The mystery is to show a complete history or prehistory of the kingdom of God in many cases. The merchant likewise shows that the majority tribes, the kingdom of Ephraim, Samaria it was called in Israel at time, they went into exile. They went into captivity and they have not all returned. The majority of Israel doesn't even know they're Israel. They're living out there and have probably lost their identity. Some cultures do recognize they came from Israel, but not all. Now, what this is talking about is that the 10 northern tribes will have to relinquish the values of the world. Remember, they are living in the sea. They are living in Satan's realm. They are going to have to put aside the values that they acquire, the things they thought that were spiritually important to move into a relationship with the pearl of greatest value, which is God himself. And that will kick off the return of Jesus Christ. Well, he comes back. So we have the, trap, the rapture would have happened already. You have Israel coming into kingdom. God is coming back. Jesus, the son of God, is coming back to rescue Israel. And he deals with the Antichrist, the false prophet first. And then he puts Satan into the pit for a thousand years where he's bound and can do nothing. But his fish are still around. You see... He has, God has to now send the angels out, the dragnet, to go ahead and bring in all those fish in Satan's realm, his sea, the sea, gather them together so that they could come out of that kingdom. That kingdom is no longer going to exist. His fish, the bad fish, are going to get burned up in hell. But people who aided who came to the aid of anyone of Israel, they are going to go into the kingdom of God as subjects. So during the tribulation period, Jewish people and people of Israel will be so persecuted that people will be against them. The bad fish, they're going into the fighter. But the people that visited them when they were in prison, the people that gave them water when they were thirsty, gave them food when they were hungry, clothed them when they were naked. As Jesus says in the parable of the sheep and the goat, if they treated their brother, his brothers like that, it was like they treated him. Finally, these people come into the kingdom as subject, or as we often call them, the guests, the wedding guests at the banquet. The mystery of Matthew 13 now is solved. We see Matthew intended it for it to be showing us the direction that history would be moving things and how the church would deteriorate, the church would eventually be rebelling, and Israel would eventually be returning. Think about what is going on? I always like to end in a so now what? My best so now what is this. Keep in mind, things are going to get progressively more evil. Therefore, it is important for us to stay focused on who Jesus is, on who God the Father is, and trust the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding like Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in him, and he's going to lead you all the way. He will make your path straight. Again, my name is Vince. I thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a great week, and God bless you richly.